Hi, I'm Mark Barsimian. In this video, I'll be discussing continuity, and I'll be taking an analytical approach. That is, I'll be discussing functions that are described by formulas, not by graphs. The reading for this video is section 2.3, continuity, and more specifically from the middle of page 121 to the middle of page 123, uh, examples 2 and 3. And the corresponding homework is homework 19. Uh, given a formula for a function f, where is f continuous? Recall our discussion from the video for homework 16. Uh, we talked about the fact that holes, jumps, and points in the wrong places are easy to spot on a graph. But a reasonable question is, um, is there some way of analyzing the formula for a function to determine if its graph would have any holes and jumps? And the answer to that question was yes, the concept of continuity allows us to do that, to analyze the formula and make those uh, conclusions. In that video, we saw the introduction of the definition of continuity, um, the, the phrase that a function is continuous at an x value means that the function passes these three tests. Test one was the limit exists at x equals c, Test 2 was the y value exists at x equals c, and test 3 was the numbers that are the value of the limit and the value of the y value have to agree. But so far in uh, homework 16 and 17 and their videos, we only discuss the continuity of functions by looking at their graphs. In this video, we'll be determining the continuity of functions that are given by formulas, not by graphs. For a given function f, we'll want to identify x values where f is not continuous, and then we'll want to describe the set of all the x values where f is continuous. There's some terminology that we'll use that's fairly self-explanatory, but it's still worth presenting in definitions. So the, this term, the, to say that a function is discontinuous at a particular x value, that just means that it's not continuous at that x value. That is, it fails the continuity test one or, or more of the parts of that test. And then we will also want to say that a function is continuous not just at a single x value, but on some set of x values. And now what that will mean when we say that the function is continuous on some whole set of x values is that the function is continuous at each x equals c, where the number c is in the set s. We'll use some old tools uh, in this uh, video and in the associated homework. We'll use the terminology and notation of intervals and of unions of intervals to describe sets of real numbers. That terminology was the subject of homework H18. Now that material is prerequisite for this course, so there was no accompanying video for that homework. New tools that we'll use are continuity properties from the book section 2.3. There is this general continuity principle. Um, if two functions are continuous on the same interval, then uh, functions that you build from those functions are also continuous. And then there's this big theorem one, continuity properties. It's got six parts. So for instance, uh, a polynomial function is continuous for all x and a rational function is continuous for all x except those values of x that make the denominator zero. It's useful to note that the continuity properties just presented are related to something that we've encountered before. To see the connection, notice that to say that a function is continuous at a particular x value means that this equation is true. That single equation embodies the three-part continuity test. Remember that for that equation to be true, in order for this equation to be true, three things have to be true. First of all, this number must exist. The thing that's sitting over here on the left side of the equal sign must exist, must be a number. And this number must exist. The thing sitting over here on the right side of the equal sign must exist, must be a number. And then finally, those two numbers must match. That is, 
the left side has to equal the right side. So that single equation actually is really the embodiment of the whole three-part continuity test that we saw in the definition of continuity. But recognize that this equation tells us that when we want to find the limit for some function f of x, if we know that the function is continuous at x equals c, then we can find the limit by simply computing the y value, f of c. This idea of knowing that we could find certain limits by, uh, more simply by just computing y values, that was the subject of theorem 2 and theorem 3 way back in section 2.1 of the book. Theorems that we used uh, in early homeworks, homeworks 4, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, for reference, here is one of those theorems. Theorem 3 we used a lot. It said if you have a polynomial function and you're trying to find the limit of that polynomial, you can compute the limit by just simply substituting in the x value, which is what you do when you compute the y value on a function. We'll do three examples involving determining the continuity of functions given by formulas. First example is this. Determine where this function, f of x, is continuous. Well, notice that um, f of x is a rational function. Let's go up and see what the continuity properties say about the continuity of rational functions. Here, a rational function is continuous at all x values except those x values that make the denominator zero. So theorem 1D tells us that this function is continuous everywhere except at those x values where the denominator is zero. So let's factor the function to find those bad x values, the ones that cause the denominator to be zero. So we see that the bad x values, the ones that cause the denominator to be zero, are x equals minus one and x equals four. So those are the x values where f of x is discontinuous. So those are the bad x values. So f is continuous at all the other x values. So we have to describe that set. So there is maybe the clearest description of the set. X is, uh, f of x is continuous at all x values except those two. But we need to be able to describe this using interval notation, and you'll need to be able to describe it using interval notation in your homework. There is the interval notation. Uh, these things here denote intervals, and this symbol is called the union symbol. So that's how we uh, do an example like this using interval notation to display the answer. For the next example, we have to determine where this function, this f of x equals this rational function, is continuous. Well, the solution again, that theorem tells us that this function is continuous everywhere except the x values that make the denominator zero. So we need to factor the denominator to figure out what x values cause it to be zero. But wait a second, the denominator is uh, 3x squared plus 12, and that can't be factor. So the denominator is this polynomial which cannot be factored into linear factors. 
so there are, since there are no linear factors, there are no x values that cause it to be zero. This makes sense because notice that x squared is always greater than or equal to zero. So that means 3x squared is always greater than or equal to zero. So that means 3x squared plus 12 is always going to be greater than or equal to 12. So it will never be zero. Okay, so since the denominator is never zero, there are no bad x values. There are no x values where f is not continuous. So since there are no bad x values, we say that the function is continuous at all real numbers. But again, we have to, for your homework system, you have to give the answer, give the set of x values where f is continuous, you have to give that answer as an interval. So in interval notation, we write this goofy looking symbol parentheses minus infinity comma infinity uh, that denotes the set of all real numbers. I don't like that notation, but it's the notation that this math book uses and a lot of math books use to describe the set of all real numbers. I think it's clearer just to say that the function is continuous everywhere. There are no bad x values, but you have to, um, you have to um, give the homework system, the computer system, the input that it is expecting. So it's expecting something like this symbol to denote the set of all real numbers. Finally, our third example, let f of x be this piecewise defined function. So our first job is to graph the function and then locate all points of discontinuity and then find the y values at all points of discontinuity and find the limit of f at all the points where the function is discontinuous. Okay, well, uh, we've actually seen this piecewise defined function on an earlier homework. It helps to remember what this piecewise formula actually means. It means this. So remember that a piecewise defined function is actually an abbreviation for a, a function that could be described in sentences. A little bit more, um, a little bit more real estate is taken up in the writing, but it makes more sense. When x is less than or equal to three, we compute f of x using this formula. When x is greater than three, we compute f of x using this formula. Well. That means that we make the graph in two pieces. We make a, a set of axes, and we put x equals 3 on the axes because that's an important spot. And uh, for x less than or equal to 3, we use this formula to, uh, to graph the function. So that's going to be a, a line that's sloping down with y-intercept 10. So there's the straight line with slope negative 2 and y-intercept 10. And notice this point on the graph is 3 comma 4 because f of 3 we compute using this formula and we get the y value 4. Now for the right part of the graph we use the parabola formula. The parabola formula is this, so we're going to have a piece of a parabola. And that open circle, it's not filled in because that is not the formula for the function when x equals 3. But if it were there, this would be the point 3, 9. 
So there's a hole. So there's the graph. Now, um, locate all points of discontinuity. Well, we can see um, that there is a jump in the graph at x equals 3. So that's a point of discontinuity. So that's the answer to B, that there is a discontinuity at x equals 3. Now question C, we're supposed to find the value of F at that point of discontinuity. Well, F of 3 equals 4, because there's a point on the graph at 3 comma 4. Now what about question D? Find the limit as X approaches C at every X value where F is discontinuous. Let's do that on the next page. So we'll do this uh, in, two, in, in two parts, well three parts. We'll find the left limit and we'll find the right limit. The limit from the left is the number 4 and that's because we can see the graph is heading for this location from the left. Now we do the right limit. So the limit is 9 because the graph is heading for this location, 3 comma 9 from the right. It doesn't matter that when we finally get to that location, there is no point there doesn't matter. For the limit, the limit is just about the trend. Where does it look like the graph is going? It looks like the graph is going towards that location, so the limit is the number 9. Now, what about the unrestricted limit from both sides? Well, notice these two limits, the left and right limits, don't match, so the limit does not exist. So the left and right limits don't match, so the limit does not exist. And that makes sense because, well, for one thing, you can see that there is no single xy location that the graph is heading for in this vicinity. It's uh, heading for one location from the left, and it's heading for a different location from the right. So it makes sense that there is no limit. And also, uh, of course, it we have already found that there is a y value and re of course the continuity test is there for a function to be continuous the limit has to exist the y value has to exist and the limit and the y value have to match well um we can see that what what flunks this function what makes it discontinuous is it flunks test 1 the limit doesn't exist So it flunks continuity test 1c. The left and right limits don't match, so the limit does not exist. So that's the end of this example, and that's the end of this video. Thank you.